If you're on a budget and can only afford one lens for any of these cameras, this is the one to buy. The term investing in gear is thrown around a lot in this field. And to quote the Princess Bride, this word you keep using, I don't think it means what you think it means. In general, gear is a horrible investment, especially in an age where camera updates come along almost every year and technology is rapidly advancing. Sure, your gear helps you book gigs, but in general, gear itself is a depreciating asset and therefore never a safe investment. This is why I personally almost only buy used gear. But semantics aside, there is one category of gear that tends to maintain its value over others, and that is glass. Lenses often outlive the cameras you bought them to pair with, and a good piece of glass on an average camera will run circles around a mediocre lens on the best camera money can buy. And because you can take glass with you from system to system, depending on your mount, it really is a much safer investment when it comes to your equipment and your career. Now on this channel, I talk a lot about Blackmagic cameras, particularly the legacy cameras, which generally utilize a micro four thirds mounting system. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about my favorite lenses that I've used with these cameras and hopefully give you some useful input on where you can lay down some money if you're in the market for new glass. I'm Will Von Toggen. If you like what you see, be sure to hit like, share, and subscribe. And with that, let's get going. Now, all of these lenses generally fall into a specific style of shooting. So when you go into this, keep in mind the type of setups you use and what type of shooting you do most often. Are you mostly shooting run and gun or are you rigging up and shooting in a controlled environment? I use these lenses on all of my Blackmagic cameras, but if you mostly shoot with the 4K versus the OG or vice versa, that may impact how much use you'll actually see from one of these lenses. Now, all these lenses also fall into different budget categories. So depending on what your resources are, that could also impact what you end up doing. The first lens I wanna talk about is geared towards those wanting to do more cinematic narrative style filmmaking, and that is this, the Vedra Mini Prime. Now I absolutely love these lenses, and I actually shot an entire feature film using them while paired with the original Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. And the results were such that most people assume I used a much more sophisticated camera and lens system. Now, of course, with primes, you're gonna to need to pick up a few of these just to cover your range of shooting, but each of these little lenses is powerful in its own way. This is the 12 millimeter, which was the widest lens Vedra made. And what's great about this and the other Vedra lenses is their cine style build and usability. They're fully manual in both focus and exposure, and they're also mechanical, meaning they have hard stops and the focus ring and the iris is controlled on the lens itself. There's also no hard clicks across the iris, allowing for smooth opening and closing of your aperture. Across the spectrum, the Vagers are nearly all uniform in length with the exception of the 85 millimeter. The gears for all lenses are located equidistant from the mounting point of the camera. And this is significant because it allows you to swap lenses fast without having to adjust things like your follow focus position and map box. Again, there's a good chance if you're using these lenses, it's more for set work. So being able to keep things uniform and moving quickly is key. All the Vedra lenses are also color matched, meaning you won't have any variance in color when changing lenses within the same scene or setting. And they're fairly fast opening up to a T 2.2. That's about an F 2.0. And the fact that they're T stopped versus F stop means that they're more precise in their exposure and that a T 2.8 on the 12 millimeter will be the exact same as a T 2.8 on the 16 or 25 millimeter. Again, this is key in matching shots when changing your setups within the same environment, such as going from a medium shot to a close up, and you need your image to keep a uniform look from lens to lens. They're fairly sharp when wide open, but I would still always advise stopping them down about one stop to a 2.8 just to get a little bit better sharpness. Again, almost all lenses when fully wide open are at their absolute softest. So to get that optimal sharpness, stop it down just a little bit. But this lens still wide open, still very sharp. All the lenses are very sturdy, very well built, very reliable. And if you don't own a matte box, you can use threaded filters with a 70 millimeter filter thread. Now, while these lenses are most ideal for narrative set work, I've also had success operating my camera solo while using these primes. And even though there's no image stabilization, with a well-built shoulder rig, you'll still have great results. So with a little practice and a little patience, you can easily use these lenses for some quality documentary work as well. Now, back when I owned a full set of these shooting my feature film, I had the 12 millimeter, 16, 25, and 35 millimeter. For the original pocket, that was plenty of range, yielding about a 35, 45, 70, and 100 millimeter full frame equivalent. However, 
If you are working with the Pocket 4K, I would advise adding the 50 millimeter as well for a little bit more length in your close-up work. Now this one specifically, the 12 millimeter, is about a 35 millimeter equivalent on the OG and the Micro. On the bigger 2.5K, it's a bit wider at 32 millimeters, and on the 4K, it's 24 millimeters, which is about as wide as you'll probably want to go for narrative work. It's sharp to its edges, and most important, there's very little bend or distortion in the image. More on that when we compare this to other 12 millimeter equivalents. Now, unfortunately, Vajra, the company, no longer exists, meaning that these lenses are only available on the used market. The good news is they're still very affordable to buy secondhand, especially for their quality, which I think is better than the Zeiss CP lenses that cost significantly more. Now, there is an alternative to Vedra, which look and act very similarly, but I don't stand behind them. Right around the time Vedra went out of business, a knockoff of the lens appeared from Miki. As I said, they look and function almost identical to the Vedras, but were retailing at about half the price when released. And shortly after their release, Vedra's warehouse had a break in and their entire inventory was stolen. I don't know what the details are, I'm not gonna make any accusations, but I don't like any of it. Vedra did something incredible bringing these lenses to the Micro Four Thirds market, and I'm very sad that they didn't make it and I don't stand behind the Miki copies. So buy Vedra if you can. The used marketplace is still full of them. And now that a few years have passed, most Vedras are for sale on eBay at a comparable price to the Mikis. It might take a bit of patience shopping around, but you could definitely get a full set of these for about 350 to 400 bucks a pop per lens used. Now, that might be a bit pricey for some of you, but they're definitely worth it. These are amazing lenses and I back them 100%. They're perfect for any of the Blackmagic Micro Four Thirds systems and they're nothing but quality. The next lens is one I've touched on briefly before and it's the Laowa 9mm 2.80D. This is a very wide angle lens, making it extremely useful when paired with the smaller sensors on some of these cameras. On the OG and the Micro, it's about a 26 millimeter equivalent, 24 on the 2.5K, and an incredible 18 millimeter equivalent on the 4K. It's fully manual, which is good because it means it's an option for the 2.5K Micro Four Thirds mount, and its compact size makes it great to turn your Micro into a compact action camera. It's fairly fast and still sharp wide open at f2.8, and it has 46 millimeter front threads for inexpensive filters. Now this lens does not have image stabilization, but because it is so wide when shooting handheld or stripped down, you don't notice the unwanted hand motion like you would on a longer non-image stabilized lens. Also, being as wide as it is makes it great for filming in tight areas, and I do find it to be a nice complement to the Vedras if you're planning to add this to that set. The color tint might be slightly different, but if you're using this to supplement the other primes for things like wide establishing shots or in tight environments, it will probably go unnoticed and get you that extra reach. For being as wide as it is, there's also very little distortion to the image. It's very common for lenses this wide to have a sort of fisheye effect. However, this is not the case on the Laowa. There is very slight distortion on the edges of the lenses, but for most shooting scenarios, this is almost unnoticeable. Now, Laowa does have a slightly wider version of this coming in at 7.5 millimeters. It's definitely helpful, but I found myself not using it as much as the nine millimeters. The 7.5 is just a little bit too wide. On the 4K, it yields a 14 millimeter equivalent, which is extremely wide and just wasn't quite as useful as the nine millimeter. And even on the OG and the micro, it was a bit much. Now, if for some reason you can afford both, get both, but if you can only pick one, I would definitely go with the nine millimeter. And I think you'll find a lot of doors opening up with this focal length. The Laowa nine millimeters can be found on eBay with a little bit of patience for about 300 bucks used or brand new for closer to 500. So this next lens is definitely my go-to lens with the Blackmagic systems. And I've touched on it a few times on this channel. It's the Panasonic 12 to 35 millimeter 2.8 with image stabilization. If you're on a budget and can only afford one lens for any of these cameras, this is the one to buy. For zoom, it's fairly fast at f2.8, and it's a constant aperture across that zoom length, meaning it doesn't stop down once you start zooming in. And at 2.8, it's actually pretty sharp, meaning you can often get away with shooting wide open and still get a clean, sharp image. The image stabilization on this lens is very good, meaning you can shoot stripped down and handheld, and if you are using a shoulder rig, you can get some pretty rock solid shots as a result. Best of all, you can get this lens used for a little over 300 bucks, making it the cheapest option on this list. The 12 to 35 millimeter range covers just about all your bases when shooting with the OG or the micro, 
but unfortunately, because it requires an active mount to control the aperture, image stabilization, and focus, which is focused by wire, the lens cannot be used with the 2.5K. On the Pocket 4K, the 12 millimeter is very wide, and on the far end, 35 millimeter makes it good for close-ups and inserts. However, it is not quite there for your ultra close-ups. Now, there is a similar lens from Panasonic, the 12 to 60 millimeter. However, it isn't a constant aperture lens and it's significantly slower. It also doesn't have image stabilization. I would not recommend that lens whatsoever and especially not above the 12 to 35 millimeter. Now, of course, if you watch this channel, you've heard me talk enough about how great this lens is. But that being said, it isn't perfect. The biggest issue is the slight distortion of the lens at 12 millimeters. On the OG and the micro, it's not too noticeable, but on the 4K, you start to see it. Here's a side-by-side -side with the Vajra 12 millimeter at 2.8. As you can see, there is a slight bend to the lens on the Panasonic. Noticeable, yes, but not a deal breaker, especially for this price point. The focus by wire also isn't the best. This was designed to be a photo lens initially, and that becomes apparent with this focus by wire. What that means is that the focus isn't mechanical. It registers the movement of the focus ring electronically. Now, the only real problem with that is that it's not consistent, meaning that the speed at which you turn the ring has more bearing over the amount that you turn it. And it can sometimes be tricky to quickly track or adjust your focus. But beyond that, I think it's a super lens. The image is great, the stabilization is great, the size and range is great. Again, if you can only afford one, this is the one to get. Now this last option is a very good option, but not one for those who are on a tight budget. This is the Canon 16 to 35 millimeter F4 L series zoom lens. Now I recommend this over the popular Sigma 18 to 35, even though the Sigma is much faster at F1.8, the Canon features image stabilization, which I think is very important for these cameras. For most shooting scenarios, I would generally take image stabilization over a wider aperture. The Canon lens itself is quite pricey and it also requires the use of a speed booster. Now Metabones makes the best iteration for the quality, it's fantastic, but the Valtrox is also an option at a lower price point. And if you wanna try and pair this with the OG or the Micro, try and find the BMPCC Super 16 specific speed booster from Metabones. They are less common these days and still pricey, but worth the extra magnification for the smaller sensor. Now, this lens is also quite sharp, and with the speed booster, the camera registers it as an f2.8, so it's still fast enough and also lets you find focus fairly easy. The image stabilization is slightly superior to the Panasonic, although the lens itself is quite a bit heavier. The focusing is more consistent than the Panasonic, and the image is fantastic. It's Canon L after all, but again, it's nearly four times the cost of the Panasonic when you factor in the speed booster. However, if you can afford it and money isn't much of a factor, it's a wonderful lens to use and I highly recommend it. Also being an EF mount and can cover full frame, it also means it's got more life to it if you wanna use it on other systems beyond Blackmagic. It's a great wide zoom, perfect for dock style work. At 16 millimeter, it's a 26 millimeter equivalent on the OG and the micro with the S16 speed booster. And on the 4K, you can get a 20 millimeter or a 23 millimeter equivalent depending on the speed booster magnification that you're using. So that makes it almost as wide as the Laowa 9 millimeter on these cameras. Now, because of the speed booster, the far end of the lens at 35 millimeter is slightly lacking, not quite letting it serve enough as a telephoto lens. To me, that is the only real downside to this combo aside from the cost. Now I used this lens almost exclusively a few months back when I was pitching a reality show. The quality, again, it's top notch. It's a dream to work with as a wide zoom and has very little distortion. Now again, it is expensive. The lens with a single Metabone speed booster is close to $1,000. That could get you three Vedras. But if you can afford it and have use for it, if you're shooting dock style work, need a wide zoom, it's a great tool to have. So what about using legacy glass and adapting old film camera primes to these cameras? While I've had a lot of fun and some good luck with that, I think it's a bit more of a hobbyist option. I do love the old Canon FDs. I used to have a really nice set. With a speed booster, they can work really well on the 4K. However, the issues I have are trying to match color between lenses, extreme softness at wide open, generally one stop closed isn't even enough, and they aren't quite wide enough for the OG or the micro, even with a speed booster. The 20 millimeter FD is about as wide as you can go, 
and even that lens starts to suffer in terms of overall image quality. Also, unless you're buying the bottom line version, meaning the f2.8 35 millimeter versus the f2.0 35 millimeter, which just aren't as good, they're almost as expensive now as a set of Vedras. So dollar for dollar, I think you'll get a lot more out of Vedra Primes over the old FDs. So something to think about, but I think I would first try and get yourself a good workhorse lens before taking this route, which has a lot more variables to it. So there you go. My pick for lenses that I like to use with the Blackmagic Micro Four Thirds camera systems, the OG, the Micro, occasionally the 2.5K and the 4K. So let me know what you think in the comments below. If you agree, disagree, or have a lens that you think is a better option. As always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.